Day of Lord Nichananda and Lord Chaitanya is Kirtan. Still, we have some short class to make. I have to leave around 9, 10 at the latest to give some devotees in New York initiation over Zoom. But we've had a gorgeous Kirtan. By the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Jai Jai Shri Chaitanya Jai Nityananda Jai Jai Shri Chaitanya Jai Nityananda Jai Chandra Jai Goa Bhakta Vrinda Jai Jai Shri Chaitanya Jai Nityananda Charitamrita Majalila Chapter 1 The Later Pastimes of Lord Chaitanya Text 203 We're in the middle of Rupa Goswami and Sanatan Goswami presenting themselves to Lord Chaitanya teaching us how to do it and we're going to focus today on their humility humility that Lord Titania said, if you don't stop this, it's making me cry. And they were crying as they fell at the feet of Lord Chaitanya. 
Not crying about, oh, how fortunate we are, how wonderful we are, but how unworthy we are to be here. We should always remember that. How unworthy we are to have a chance to take shelter of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. We'll describe the situation leading up to this verse that we'll chant. You'd be surprised to know that Lord Chaitanya's Leela seemed to be entwined with social political events. The external covering. His pastimes took place during the time when a good portion of India was under the control of Muslim invaders. Yet, Mahaprabhu's pastimes, in which he's distributing love of Krishna, teaching love of Krishna, and experience love of Krishna, these pastimes are all going on at the same time. Letting us know that bhakti can triumph unimpeded in any material circumstance depending on the sincerity and intensity of the devotees. So Lord Chaitanya seemingly was on his way to Vrindavan. Finally, he was going to get to go to Vrindavan. But on the way, for some special reason, he stopped at a village called Ramakali. And thousands of persons were following him. Wherever Lord Chaitanya walked, thousands of people would dig up the road, creating holes in the road. (laughs) And so this huge crowd came to the attention of the Mohammedan ruler. And he's calculating, what kind of person is this? He's got thousands of people following him and he's not giving them anything material? (laughs) Very unusual. (laughs) He must be some kind of prophet. So he consulted with his assistant, Keshava Chatri, who obviously was a Hindu because the the Mohammedans were using the Hindus to rule, as well as their own people. So he asked Keshava Chhatri, who is this? And Keshava Chhatri was very diplomatic, making politics. He said, ah, he's just an insignificant wandering beggar. He only has a few people following him. Don't pay him any attention. It's not worth the effort. Keshava Chatri was thinking that mm, you never know these politicians. They could change their mind any moment. So I don't want the, the ruler to get too fascinated with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So Keshava Chatri told the ruler, I think you should tell your district manager, your Muslim district manager, who seems to be jealous of this prophet, this mendicant. Tell him, don't bother, it's not worth it. Then, because Rupa Goswami, in his preliminary or apparent status as a conditioned soul, was a top official in the Muslim regime, advisor to the, like he and his brother Sanatan were prime ministers. And so, naturally, the Mohammedan ruler turned to Rupa and said, well, what's your opinion? And Rupa very, you know back then their names were Dabirkas and Sakara Malik. We'll get into that later. So, Rupa told him that whatever comes to your mind, that's what he is. Because you as king are representing the Supreme Personality of God. It, So, listen to your mind and what it tells you. This is very interesting. How can Rupa Goswami tell this meat-eating Mohammedan ruler to 
listen to his mind to understand who is changing the Mahaprabhu. No doubt the influence of Rupa was there. <laughs> so the Mohammedan ruler thought to himself, then he said, my mind tells me he is the supreme personality of Godhead. <laughs> and of course, Rupa Goswami was very pleased. Yes, yes, you are right. <laughs> but then, immediately that evening, Rupa Goswami <laughs> sent a message to Lord Chaitanya's camp. Better you move on. You can't trust him. <laughs> Just see how expert the Vaishnavas are. <laughs> They understand the power of material association. Someone can flip because of their association. You see it. Unfortunately, it does happen to those who take up the bhakti process. Uh, They can become negative just by bad association. Why are you giving up everything for Krishna? (laughs) Who are these persons who are leading you? Go out, make money, and enjoy throw yourself fully into your career just look they have some of them wearing saffron that could happen to you (laughs) look at this savior Bhagavan one minute he's wearing white then he changes into saffron (laughs) Arjuna Saka and all these deviants So, by bad association, that can happen. (laughs) (laughs) Of course, the Vaishnava Sangha is the most exalted association. But the materialistic, this is bad association. (laughs) So, Rupa, even though the king had just said, in my mind, I see that he's the Supreme Personality Godhead, Rupa's not sentimental. (laughs) He knows. This guy can flip (laughs) because of his association, because of his lifestyle, because of his habits. Mm. So then, Lord Chaitanya proceeded to Ram Kaili. A very special visit because Mahaprabhu himself will say, no one understands my intentions in coming here. The purpose was very grave, very deep. Rupa and Sanatan took advantage of Lord Chaitanya's presence to sneak away in the middle of the night, disguised to go see him. In the middle of the night, disguised. They had to be very strategic because they were so crucial to the Mohammedan regime. They were like the prime ministers. And the Mohammedan king was like the executor. He was like the premier. So he relied on them. And they knew it. They knew he would get very angry if he knew that they were slipping away to become full-time Vaishnavas. At least they should discuss it with him, but they snuck away in the middle of the night. And they approached Nityananda Prabhu and Haridas Thakur asking to see Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu showing us that you approach Lord Chaitanya through his devotees through his genuine servitors and Nityananda Prabhu and Haridas Thakur told Mahaprabhu they're here to see you and Mahaprabhu granted them audience They fell at Lord Chaitanya's feet with very major signs of their declaring themselves as surrendered souls, humble surrendered souls. What they did may sound funny to you these days because it's not the current way to show utter humility. They put straw in their mouth and they put a cloth around their neck, bound around their neck. These are traditional signs that I'm declaring that I am yours. I'm declaring my utter desperate humility at your feet. Any of you have done that? Put straw in your mouth and fallen at the feet of your Guru Maharaj and said, 
I'm declaring myself. No, you don't do that. You don't put a cloth bound around your neck to show you're a, like some kind of prisoner. You don't do that. <laughs> but Rupa and Sanatan did that. And that was the way at the time to demonstrate your status, what you're declaring yourself to be. And as they were falling at the feet of Lord Chaitanya, not just saying Danyavad, but falling fully at Lord Chaitanya's feet like rods. They were crying. Why were they crying? As we said, they were crying because they felt so worthless. What are we doing here? We have no qualification whatsoever. Yet we're desperately begging Lord Chaitanya. So Mahaprabhu told them that <clears throat> you please stand up. Your humility is breaking. It's making me cry. It's breaking my heart. <clears throat> they got up and again they put straw in their mouth. They're not finished with their presentation. They are really going to convince Lord Chaitanya he has to deliver them. And this is what we should be focusing on. One of the many things we can focus on today, Gaur Purnima. <clears throat> they introduce themselves. We are the lowest of persons because of our association and employment. Now, actually, they were born in high-class Brahmana caste. But they considered that they were abominable because they accepted the employment of materialists. They were employed at the top by the Mohammedan regime. So they considered that we are trash. They overlooked completely their caste by birth and looked at their association, teaching us that we should always examine our association because we will become like whom we associate with. We want to associate with devotees who are making spiritual advancement. That kind of association will carry us through all the challenges of life. And living in this world, in a material body, is a challenge. So, understand Rupa and Sanatana's humility which was making Lord Chaitanya cry. They weren't just saying these things. Oh, I'm so fallen, Prabhu. Well, meanwhile, thinking, actually, I'm great. When will you notice? <laughs> <laughs> they actually felt this way, just like Kaviraj Goswami and Chaitanya Charitamrita really felt that I'm lower than a worm and stool and more sinful than Jagai and Madhai. You see, Jagai and Madhai are the gold standard for sinfulness. <laughs> in case you didn't know. But here, Kaviraj Goswami in Chaitanya Charitamrita is saying, I'm more sinful than them. And then you're going to hear Rupa and Sanatan's version of comparing themselves to Jagai and Madai. Because again, that's the, that's the gold standard. <laughs> so, <clears throat> they want to inform Lord Chaitanya about their position. There's no, more, there's no one more sinful than us. There's no one more of an offender than us. Now, your mission is as Patita Pavan, delivering the fallen souls. You should know that there is no one worse than us. So in other words, your mission has to include us because your mission is to deliver the worst. Here we are, right in front of you, the worst. How can they really mean this? Could you come before the deities and say, I'm the worst, truly meaning it? No, you may. I'm not so bad, but I do have some problems. Can you help me? But generally, I'm pretty good. I'm a good devotee. <laughs> but to feel in the core of your heart that you're the worst, oh, that takes Krishna consciousness. And then he brought up, as I said, the gold standard, Jagai and Madha. You delivered them, but you didn't have to exert yourself so much. They just did a few sinful activities, 
But we accepted the employment. We accepted the employ of meat eaters, materialists. Jagai and Madai never did that. They were born in a high class Brahmana family. They grew up in Navadvikdam. All right, they did a few outrageous things. Actually, they, they had so many sinful activities, they couldn't be recorded. <laughs> But this is Rupa and Sanatana's genuine vision. They did some sinful activities, but we're worse because they never accepted the, they never worked for anyone else. Because when you work for someone else, you've got to be like a dog barking, offending others just for the sake of getting your money. That's our situation. Mm. And anyway, they said, whatever sinful activity Jagai and Madhai did, by chanting the holy names, even mockingly, those sinful activities were all cleansed. But us, we are, they said, we too are millions and millions of times inferior to Jagai and Madai. We are more degraded, fallen, and sinful than they. Actually, we are meat eaters. Why? Because we associated with meat eaters, so we are meat eaters too. They never said that they, they didn't. We are meat eaters because we associate with meat eaters. This is again teaching us about association. They describe themselves as being bound by the neck and thrown into a ditch filled with human wastes. Very graphic. You can just see yourself bound up with ropes and thrown into a ditch containing human waste. They considered the material sense objects to be those hum- to be like a human waste in a ditch. <laughs> so then they appealed to Mahaprabhu. If you deliver us, then your reputation as Patita Pavana will be intact. To, to give Patita Pavana the true meaning You've got to deliver us. Because there's no other suitable object of mercy like us within all the three worlds. You won't find anyone as bad as us. So in need of your mercy. We are the most fallen Therefore, by showering your mercy upon us, your mercy is most successful. They're really making a brilliant case, aren't they? (laughs) Let the power of your mercy be exhibited throughout the entire universe. (laughs) So then they speak. Namrasha paramartha meva me, shinu vigapana me kam agrita, yadimena daishya se tada, dayaniyas tava nata dulava. Let me, let us submit one piece of information before you, dear Lord. It is not at all false but is full of meaning. It is this. If you are not merciful upon us, then it will be very, very difficult to find more suitable candidates for your mercy. We're depressed at being unfit candidates for your mercy. But hearing about your transcendental qualities, we are so much attracted to you. We know we're like dwarfs trying to capture the moon. (laughs) But still, they're making this plea. (laughs) Can we convince Lord Chaitanya like that? Even just a drop of that ocean. The ocean of dainyamrita, the ocean of genuine dainya, humility. Oh, to be empowered in that way. In the material world, everyone wants to be empowered to be the best. But here we see what the best are pleading for. And how they, how the best present themselves. 
So I've explained before about the quality of dainya, as Sanatana Goswami comments on it in his Brihad Bhagavatamrita. Dainya, or utter desperate humility, doesn't mean actually that you're useless from the point of view of skill and service. I make a mess of all my services that I do for Krishna because I'm, I'm so fallen. Sanatana Goswami says that's not real dainya. Real dainya is that even though every, all the other Vaishnavas can see that you're doing things very expertly, you yourself think you're useless. You're highly motivated in serving Krishna, you're dedicated to Krishna's pleasure, and you're so attentive to executing devotional service very nicely. But still you think, I am useless. So that is real dainya, Sanatana Goswami explains. Not that oh, I'm useless for booze, that's why I can't do any service properly and I space out during my devotional service or I, I don't show up and I don't tell anyone when I don't show up. It's, it's because I'm, you know, I'm fallen, I'm very useless. That, Sanatana Goswami says, is not real humility. <laughs> so in this way, Rupa and Sanatana can teach us after hearing their prayer, Mahaprabhu says, I accept you, I change your names, showing us the importance of initiation. Otherwise, as Prabhupada warns in the purport, if your names don't change at the time of initiation, you continue in the bodily conception of life. So there's more to initiation than just a formality and getting a, an, another name. There's some, you're formally enrolling in the Bhakti Academy and there is some, there are some special privileges awarded because you made a commitment. Mm. Mahaprabhu flashes back and says, you've wrote, written me some letters and in those letters I could see your deep humility. I could understand your consciousness from your letters. And so I sent you. I wrote back. I had someone send you a message. Very interesting verse about how to execute bhakti in all circumstances, especially on the Raga Bhakti platform. I wrote back. Para vyavasani nadi. Para vyavasani nadi. Vyagrapi graha karma su. Tat evas vadayat yantar. Navasanga Rasayana. Interesting verse. If a woman is attached to a man other than her husband, don't do it, she will appear very busy in carrying out her household affairs. But within her heart, she's always relishing feelings of association with her paramour. So, how does that relate to Rupa and Sanatana Goswami? They were embedded deep in the Mohammedan regime and association. And we're writing Lord Chaitanya and he's telling them, do your external affairs very expertly so that no one suspects where your heart is really at. In your heart, relish Krishna Sangha, Krishna Bhakti, but so that no one suspects. The same advice was given to who remembers? Raghunath Das Goswami, who was always trying to run away from home. And Lord Chaitanya told him, don't act like a madman. Be, in other words, be strategic, be tactical. <laughs> Do your household affairs so expertly so that no one suspects where you're really at. <laughs> Just like a woman attached to a paramour does her household affairs so expertly so the husband doesn't suspect. But in her heart, she's always thinking, when will I meet him? When will I meet him? What is he doing now? So this is an instruction about bhakti, especially at the higher levels of bhakti. Because the spontaneous devotees externally seem the same as those devotees on the platform of rules and regulations. But within, there's the difference. So Mahaprabhu says, I really had no business in coming to Bengal. 
but I've come just to see you brothers. No one knows my intentions. They don't know why I came here. Birth after birth, you've been my eternal servants. I'm sure Krishna will deliver you very soon. Lord Chaitanya is confirming that actually Rupa and Sanatana are Nitya Siddha. They're his eternal associates. They seem at first to be embedded in material life. Just like Prabhupada seemed to be just absorbed in family affairs and business while helping out the local temple. But never was there a time when he forgot Krishna. So similarly, Rupa and Sanatan externally seem to be embedded in Mohammedan government, Mohammedan association. But at the right time, they manifest where they're really at. So Mahaprabhu puts his two hands on, one hand on each, on the head of Rupa, one hand on the head of Sanatan, to give them his blessings. And they fall on his feet, putting his feet on their heads. And then Lord Chaitanya Ask all the Vaishnavas present. Bless them, please. Empower them. And they, the Vaishnavas happily do that. They're not thinking, oh, someone's going to take our share of the mercy. <laughs> someone's going to take up time and for our association with Mahaprabhu. No, they want to see things increase. And of course, Rupa and Sanatana, they beg the Vaishnavas for their mercy. So today let us approach, let us try to approach Lord Titania in a, just a little bit of the way that Rupa and Sanatana approach it. And you'll see the difference. Feel the desperation and hopelessness of Rupa and Sanatana as they declare themselves to Lord Titania. You must deliver us. In that way, your reputation as Patita Pavna will be justified. You won't find anyone more suitable for your mercy than us. We've got to convince Mahaprabhu of that. This should be our mission today, one of our missions. So this evening, at moonrise, Mahaprabhu appears. You know, he chose to appear at the time of the full moon lunar eclipse because there would be thousands upon thousands of people in the Ganga chanting Hare Krishna. And that is the mission of Mahaprabhu, that the whole world should chant the Maha Mantra. This mission started in Navadvi, but actually from there it goes all over the world and even all over the universe. Mahaprabhu is known as Sankirtan Pravartaka. He's the initiator, the inaugurator of the Sankirtan mission, which actually covers not just the earth planet, but the whole universe. It starts in Navadri and then goes all over the world, as it's done now. And from here, it goes all over the universe. Maybe some of you will participate in that in your next devotional service. <laughs> so all of Navadweep is in the Ganga because that's the prescribed uh, behavior when there's a, an eclipse. They're all in the Ganga chanting Hari, Hari, and Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari, Hari, Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, 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 Hari, Hari. But for the older devotees here, like Prana Prabhu and can't see any others. Forgive me if I didn't mention your name. <laughs> Lord Chaitanya, he's Krishna, and Krishna is very tricky. Jiva Goswami explains that there's a trick going on by Lord Chaitanya appearing at the lunar eclipse and during a time when everyone's in the Ganga chanting Hari and Hari Krishna. The hidden trick, Jiva Goswami explains, is that there is the moon-like Srimati Radharani. And so Krishna wants that while everyone is thinking they're chanting Hari and Hare Krishna, referring to Krishna, he knows they're actually chanting the glories of the moon-like Srimati Radharani. 
whose name is Hara. She steals away the emotions of Krishna by her nature, by her form, by her qualities. So when you say Hare Krishna, Hare is referring to Hara in the form of addressing. So here everyone's in the Ganga, Hare Hare and Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. But Jiva Goswami explains they've been tricked. They're actually glorifying Shimati Radharani. <laughs> it's a linguistic trick. <laughs> Do I have one time for one more advanced pastime for the older devotees? Mm-hmm. This is recorded in a work by Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur called the Swapna Vilasamrita Ashtaka. It's about the dreams of Srimati Radharani, which are non different from what she does when she's awake. In her dreams, she associates with Krishna, and when she's awake, she associates with Krishna. But she had a very special dream, and she asked Krishna about it. She said, I had this dream. I don't understand. I was on the bank of a river that was... The dream showed me a scene on the bank of a river that was not the Yamuna, and there were, but it was like the Yamuna, and there were people dancing, just like we dance in Braj. And there were persons playing Radanga, other instruments, just like we play in Braj. And there was this person, this Brahmana, who was chanting and dancing in such ecstasy, calling out, Oh Krishna, oh Radha! And he was getting everyone, all living entities, from blades of grass to Lord Brahma, to chant his name. (laughs) It's very confusing to me. So she was asking Krishna, "I, I can't figure this out. Because while looking at this person, I was wondering, is it Krishna? If he's Krishna, then where am I? Where's Radha? Is he me? If he's me, Radha, then where is Krishna? She go back and forth like this. Is he Krishna? Then where am I? Is he me? Then where is Krishna? Back and forth, back and forth. She was presenting this confusion to Krishna, who's smiling. (laughs) Very confidentially. So he says to his dear beloved that why are you so confused? You've seen all my incarnations. You've seen me as Narayan. You've seen me as avatars. Why is this particular vision confusing you so much? So then he said watch this. He pointed to his Kastuba gem. So Vishnath Chakravarti Thakur explains He points to his Kastuba gem and says, look and see what's happening. And the Kastuba gem started to reveal the same pastime on the bank of this river with the chanting and dancing and the ecstasy of distributing love of Krishna. The Kastuba gem was showing Srimati Radharani the same scene and she became even more entranced. And then she got it. I see This is both of us. This person is both of us. Teaching the world the essence of ecstatic love and distributing the taste of our love. This is us, this person. As you know, you should know. Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Radha Krishna Nahayanya. Lord Chaitanya is Radha Krishna combined. So Srimati Radharani recognized, he's us. And he's glorifying our love. That is his mission. And she became so overwhelmed with this emotion of recognizing who Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is that 
she started glowing even more golden, so strongly that she influenced Krishna to turn golden. So these two golden personalities, seeing what's happening to both of them, just laughed. <laughs> so that is Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's revelation of Shimati Radharani's dream of Goranga. All right. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.